I stand accused There's a list a mile long Of all my sin And everything that I've done wrong I'm so ashamed There's nowhere left for me to hide This is the day I must answer for my life My fate is in the judge's hands But then he turns to me and says I know you, I love you I gave my life to save you Love paid the price for mercy guilty how can it be I can't begin to comprehend what kind of grace would take the place for all my sin I stand in awe now that I have been set free and the tears well up as I look at that cross when it should have been me. My fate was in those nail-scarred hands. But then he stretched for me and said, I know you, I love you, I gave life to save you. Love paid the price for mercy. My verdict, not guilty. I'm falling on my knees to thank you. With everything I am, I'll praise you. So grateful for the words I heard you say. to save you. Love paid the price for mercy. My verdict, not guilty. This morning I'm going to be preaching a special message, a different message, and honestly a I mean, a pretty bold, a pretty bold attempt uh, in one message to try to cover a lot. Um, did want to say, and just in, even in lieu of the message this morning, it's a blessing. I know Kim Fisher has a lot of her family here, uh, but also uh, Mike and Kim have their neighbors here, Yair and Maya, and their mother, and they are Jews. And their mother literally just came from Israel three days ago. And we want you to know we're praying for you, your family, your friends. We love you. And, and, you know, in spite of all the stuff being said, there are people that love and support the people of Israel. And the Lighthouse Baptist Church is one of them. Amen. And so we're honored. We're honored to have you here this morning. Let's all stand together and take our Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. If you have a marker or ribbon... If you will also just put it in Romans 11, Romans 11, as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, I've always made it, and I believe just because the Lord would have it this way, is, is I, I don't see myself as a political pastor, a political preacher, and when I deal with issues, uh, I, don't, I don't really worry about the politics of it, I'm looking at things through the Bible, what does the Bible say? And so there are, there are times where there are things where, um, you know, there's really not much to say about. But, but, but the current events and things that are taking place are, are 
very heavily biblical. And, and I think it's very important for us to understand what the Word of God says, and also for our younger generation to understand what the Word of God says about these things. And so I um, want to take us to maybe a passage that many people might not think much about, but this passage is the right passage for this topic this morning. Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says this, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath the place prepared of God, that they should... Feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found in any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his life, uh, uh, the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time, and the face of the serpent. The serpent was cast out of his mouth, water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Powerful, powerful passage. I want to preach on this subject with the Lord's help. Why the world hates Israel. Why the world hates Israel. Let's pray. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. And I pray, God, that you would help us to understand. Not, not this instance or that instance. But to understand the overarching theme of what is happening on this planet and what has happened ever since the beginning of Israel. Bless your word. Give me clarity. Help me to move through this in a way that is understandable and helpful. May your spirit take hold of these words and speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A couple days ago, I was reading a Time magazine article published with the title of this, how, how the activist left turned on Israel. It goes on to say this, Daniel Sokach has spent much of his career fighting for equal rights for Israelis and Palestinians. As CEO of the New Israel Fund, he runs the largest global organization promoting democracy and equality for all who live under Israeli control. Sokic was horrified to hear the news of Hamas's massacre of Israeli civilians on October 7th. By the way, that's what it was. But what further shocked him was the immediate response from some of his fellow advocates for Palestinian rights. 
The reaction reeked of anti-Semitism, Socket says. You can celebrate the slaughter of those people just because they're Israeli in a way that you wouldn't do anywhere else in the globe. Instead of condemning and mourning the deadliest day for the Jews since Israel's founding, factions of the grassroots left appeared to, this is in the Time magazine, appeared to celebrate the assault as an act of Palestinian heroism. The national chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine called it a historic win for Palestinian resistance. A coalition of 34 Harvard student organizations issued a statement saying they hold the Israeli regime entirely responsible for the unfolding violence. The Democratic Socialists of America promoted a pro-Palestinian rally in New York where attendees reportedly chanted, resistance is justified when people are occupied. One was shown displaying a swastika. A Twitter account apparently belonging to Black Lives Matter in Chicago posted an image of a paraglider with a Palestinian flag on X appearing to celebrate the Hamas terrorists who descended to slaughter hundreds of Israelis at a music festival. The glorification and justification of violence against civilians, now listen to what he says, is not something I have seen in this movement in the 25 years I have been looking at it, says the vice president of the Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism. When I see the rapid rise of anti-Israel sentiment in our country, when I see the parades marching throughout Europe and Greece and the Middle East and our own, our own college campuses with flags, not just with flags of Palestine, but with boards vilifying Israel and promoting and celebrating the death of innocent Jews, I have a very clear picture in my mind. When I see that and read about that, and I look at it biblically, a picture literally comes to my mind of a dragon hovering over a woman about to give birth. You see, in that picture, you find all the answers to the questions. Someone says, Pastor, well, what's going on? Why, why is there why is there this massive uprise of, of not, just, not just a desire to see Palestinians live in peace, but the celebration and hatred for the people of Israel? Why is there so much anger and hatred towards the only dem democracy that exists within the Middle East? And I would say to you this answer, it is the dragon hovering over the woman ready to give birth. For us to understand the things that we see unfolding, we need to kind of unpack the picture of the dragon and the woman and the child. And as we begin to kind of work through that, we begin to understand things that are unfolding and have unfolded really over the course of human history. Let's start with the dragon. The Bible tells us in verse 9 the identity of this dragon. It says, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent, referring to Genesis, called the devil and Satan. The word Satan means adversary. The word devil means slanderer or accuser. We won't take the time because I have a lot of information that I want to give, but if you take the time and you read through Isaiah and Ezekiel, you begin to piece together the story of who this Satan was, this devil is, this Lucifer as he's referred to in the Old Testament, that he was the most powerful angel in heaven and he was, I believe, used to bring, he was primarily in charge of bringing praise and glory to God. The Bible describes the harps and, and the instruments that he had and so he was this magnificent angelic being who was designed and created by God to sing and to lead the, the angelic choir in this incredible praise and magnificent worship to the Lord. But as Ezekiel and Isaiah described, he became 
he became intoxicated with his own beauty. He became proud in his own glory. And he began to see himself as being exalted to where he got to the place where he not only wasn't satisfied being second under God, but he wanted to overthrow God and become the king of heaven. And so he became the adversary of God, the slanderer of God, as he began to turn to other angelic beings to turn them against God and join with him in his revolt or in his coup against God Almighty. What's amazing is he was very successful in many ways. In verse 4 it says this, speaking of the dragon, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. This is a reference to the angelic host. You see this affirmed in verse 7 when it says, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Now notice this. And the dragon fought and his angels. And so the idea is that the dragon, this Lucifer, became an adversary to God. And he was so powerful and he was so convincing and he was so mesmerizing that he was able to convince one thing third of the angelic host to join him in battling against God. That tells you his persuasion. It tells you his power. It tells you his influence capacity. But as any being, no matter how strong, no matter how great, goes against God, you can never defeat God. And so it says in verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now look at verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil. And Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So he goes to war against God. He's defeated and God displaces him from having power in heaven. He can still go to heaven, he can still accuse the brethren, but God will, would no longer allow him to enter into heaven for the purpose of warring against him and fighting against him. Satan was defeated and thrown out of heaven and thrust down to the earth and no longer has the capacity. God gives him no allowance to fight against him. But Satan hates God with everything in him. And Satan has at his disposal one third of the angelic host willing to do whatever he wants them to do. And and Satan, though he cannot war directly with God, from this point on has determined he is still going to war against God. And so what what does Satan do? What does he do when he can't go to heaven and fight God? He fights everything that God loves. We know as he's referred to as the serpent, he looked at earth and he saw this. The crown of God's creation was man and woman. That when God created the earth, he placed man and woman there. And above all of the beauty and all of the splendor of creation, Adam and Eve were the center of his love. Adam and Eve were they the only thing he made in his own image. And he cherished walking with them and a relationship with them. And in his plan, they would have children and they would have the life of God and be the sons of God with the Lord. And so we know this. I won't, we don't have time for this. But what does he do? He comes in the form of a serpent. He tempts Eve. He lures Eve away. He slanders God and accuses God of withholding blessings and honor and, the, and wisdom that they could have. And so what does Eve do? She bites of the fruit and Adam bites of the fruit. And they choose independence from God. And in that moment, Satan, through his deception, causes a fracture between man and God. Because God is perfectly holy and cannot walk and cannot dwell and cannot be amongst sin. And so now you have this scene where Adam and Eve have to leave the garden. They are separated from God. And the devil has found in his mind a temporary victory. So the dragon is the devil who was thrust out. And seeks to displace and kill everything that God loves. Which then leads us to the woman. In verse 1, the Bible describes a woman. It says this, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman 
clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. All of this has great imagery. The picture of the sun and the moon, for those who were Jews, would have instantly went back to Genesis 37. Just You can jot these down. For sake of time, I'm going to work through some scripture. But where it refers to God working through Joseph in the promise and the dream of Joseph, it says this in Genesis 37, 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said... Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him. So in this dream, you have the father and the mother as the sun and the moon, and the stars represent the brothers of Joseph who comprise the children uh, of Israel. And so what you have is you have this picture of uh, going back to the 12 stars, this woman represents Israel. The 12 stars representing each tribe under Israel. Now here's why this is important. Because once the serpent attacked Adam and Eve and won in his mind, God had already a plan for how he would, get this, how he would bring humanity back to him. Adam and Eve have sinned. They've been displaced from the garden. Satan has seemingly won. But God already had a plan. And his plan was brought forth in Genesis... Now follow me, it's all going to make sense. His plan was brought forth in Genesis 12... ...when God met with a man named Abraham... ...and said this in Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram... ...get thee out of thy country... ...and from thy kindred... ...and from thy father's house... ...unto a land that I will show thee... And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless him that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So now Adam and Eve have fallen, sin has come, but God wants a relationship with man. He wants to still walk with man and know man and allow man to live with him in heaven. So God comes to Abram and says, here is the plan, Abram. Through you, you're going to have a son. And your son is going to have a son. And that son is going to have 12 sons. And through those 12 sons... Through Jacob, who God would eventually call Israel, would come a mighty nation. A mighty nation. Though Abram, though you're going to be old, though you don't see it, through your lineage is going to come a mighty nation through the lineage of Jacob. Twelve sons that we know as Israel or the Jewish people. And I am going to bless that nation. And, and, and not listen, not because they're better than someone else or different than someone else. God says, I am going to take them and make them mine. And my hand and power will be on them. And they will bless all nations that through them, get it, my plan for man to know me will be restored. So you have, get it, you have the dragon who is the devil. You have the woman who is Israel, 12 tribes coming through her, which asks the question, how did God plan to use Israel to bless all people and restore what had fallen in the Garden of Eden? That's when you have to come to the man-child. So you have this woman, verse 2, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered, verse 5, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Here you have this woman, Israel, getting ready to give birth. Through the seed of Israel would come this man-child who is going to rule and going to reign. Now the Jewish people would immediately, when they read that language, would immediately begin to think about passages in the scripture where God promised that through the line of Israel would come a Messiah. We're coming into Christmas. A, a very popular passage is in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Listen to the language. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, 
the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice, a judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The idea is this, is that through Israel, this nation would come one individual who would be the Messiah, who would bring justice. But listen, it would stretch forth just beyond the Jewish people. Isaiah 42, 1 says this, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine right hand. And will keep thee and give thee for a covenant for the people a light for the Gentiles. So through Israel, 12 tribes, and you follow it, you you go down the Old Testament, it would be the lineage of David. Through the line of David would come this Messiah who would bring justice and righteousness, not just for Israel, but for Israel as well. And for all people, they would be blessed. Mercy, who is this man, child? Well, in Luke chapter 2, describing the birth of Jesus Christ, the Bible says this in verse 27. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Which thou hast prepared before thy face for all people, a quoting from Isaiah, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. You come to verse 17 of Revelation 12 and you see exactly who the man child is when it says this. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, notice, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Christ, through the nation of Israel, through the seed of David, would be born fulfilling countless hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in where his birth was and how his birth unfolded. And historical events after his birth came Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who came and lived and died for the sins of all people so that by faith in him, all people could know salvation and be restored to him. The woman was chosen by God to be this mighty, powerful nation that would produce the man-child, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that through the man-child, God would once again reach out to humanity to restore what the serpent had taken away in the garden to bring man back to salvation. And so you have the dragon, the woman, the man-child. And so you have verse 4. And his tail drew... The third part of the stars of heaven, and to cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Here we see the devil watching Israel. Watching for what? The birth of the Messiah. Why? To kill him as soon as he's born. In other words, get this. From the moment that God summoned and called Israel, the devil was hovering over Israel, desiring to stop the nation of Israel from ever producing the Messiah for all the nations. Let me say this. He was hovering long before the manger. He was hovering in Exodus chapter 1. When the Bible says, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt... Which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, and let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there followed out any war, they join also unto armies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set their taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. Verse 13, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. Verse 15, and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shiphrath and the other was Puah. And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew woman and see them, 
If it be a son, ye shall kill him. If it be a daughter, then she shall live. All the way back in the book of Exodus, you see national powers seeking to kill the lineage and the people of Israel. You go through, you come to the story of Esther, where, where you have Haman and you have this Persian empire. And the Bible says this about Haman in Esther chapter 3 verse 8. And Haman said unto King Hazarias, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the provinces of the kingdom. And their laws, now listen to this, tell me this sounds so similar to things even in the last 50 years. Their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the, ling, the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. Verse 13, and the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day. You go through the Old Testament, and here's what you find. Kings and powers come into play, and of all the people groups, the children of Israel, the Jewish people, come under the scope of mighty nations to completely eliminate them from existence. Why? Because there's a dragon, there's a devil hovering over Israel, and he hates Israel because God loves Israel, and God has a plan for a man-child, and he wants to stomp out the seed of Israel. You come to the New Testament. And Jesus Christ is born. And Herod finds out about this king of the Jews. And in Matthew 2.16 it says this. Then Herod when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men. Was exceeding wroth and sent forth. And slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And in all the coast thereof from two years old and under. What prompted King Herod to seek out to destroy all the children, two years and younger, it was the dragon deceiving him to stomp out the seed, the man-child of the woman. You come to the very end, the man-child is grown. He is fully grown. He is a grown man. His name is Jesus Christ. And yet the devil is not done. In Luke chapter 23, it says, Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, justice knew what was right, spake again to them. But they cried, saying... Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, What evil hath he done? I find no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. Up to the very, listen, to the very end, the devil not understanding the purposes of the Messiah, he was looking to stamp out the man child. But but verse 5 tells us something very important in chapter 12. <laughs> she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God, uh-oh, and to his throne. In other words, the devil throughout human history, he could not stamp out Israel. He could use Persian kings, Egyptian kings. He could use people with all kinds of malice and hatred. But he was unable to stamp out Israel and the seed. And Jesus came and Jesus died. And Jesus paid for the sins of the world. And three days later, praise God, he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. And that is where he is on the right hand of the Father at his throne offering salvation the devil spent human history trying to stamp out a seed and he failed but the dragon's not done because there are still humans on the planet and there is still an opportunity to hurt the heart of God verse 13 and when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. Jesus came. Jesus died. Jesus paid for the sins. He rose from the dead. He ascended. There's nothing, that, there's nothing that Satan can do about that. But you know what he sees on the earth? The woman. Israel. She's still around. She's still here. And wait a minute, now get this. And God has a plan for Israel. Hold your place here and look at, look at Romans chapter 11. 
Look at Romans chapter 11. If you're with me, say amen. amen. I know we're working quick, but it, it's, it's important so that y'all can get out of here before four. Right, Romans 11, notice verse 25. For I would not, now Paul is a Jew writing to Gentiles who are being saved and believing on Jesus by the droves. And at this point, Israel is not turning to the Lord and they're beginning to look at Israel as though God is done with them. But Paul says this, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness has partly happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become... And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sin. You can go back to Revelation. Paul says this, understand, there's a lot of things going on on the planet right now. But the Messiah, the Savior, when God said he would come and rule and reign... ...in Jerusalem and that the tribes of Israel would be there and be a part. That is, not, that is not a metaphor. That is not hyperbole. That is literal. God has a plan to bring Israel unto himself. And one day when Jesus comes and establishes his reign, his a thousand year reign on the earth... The, listen to me, the Jewish people will turn to him as a nation and worship God and all of us Gentiles will be part of the, of the great story as God does this mighty work in fulfilling his promise to the people of Israel. And so God, and so the devil knows this. And so here's what the devil wants to do. I'm going to stamp out Israel. There'll be no future reign. They'll, they, I, don't, I, want them, I, I don't want them in the land I want them out of the land. I want them gone. So how does the dragon work to destroy the woman? Well, notice verse 9 again. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, here's how he works, which deceiveth the whole world. Now, Satan doesn't come down here in physical form and, and, and destroy people. He deceives people. Into what? Hating the woman. Hating Israel. You follow after, I'm going to give you just some quick brief history. You follow Israel after Jesus ascends. In 70 AD, the Roman Empire sieges Jerusalem and rules over the Jews. They destroy the temple. They kill over 1. million Jews. They take 97,000 for slaves. And they allowed 47,000 to scatter and live wherever they wanted to go. During the reign of the Roman Empire, there was constant conflict... There was constant fighting and there was constant civil war between the Jewish people and the Roman Empire over their land and their city. The Roman Empire removed Jewish law, executed religious leaders, and built an image of Jupiter over the Temple Mount, displacing hundreds and thousands of Jews and sent them away as slaves. From there, you follow and you jump into the Middle Ages, you jump into the Crusades, where the, where the Catholicism, governmental, governmental Christianity, not true biblical Christianity, chose to observe and label Jews as the enemies of God, misunderstanding the scripture, and thus during the Crusades, justified all kinds of atrocious acts against the Jews. In the first crusade, Jews were forced to hand over money and possessions. Thousands were forced to be baptized or die. Above it all, there were direct attacks of murders on the Jews in the Rhineland area and, and places such as Worms and Mainz. All through Europe, communities were destroyed. It is mess estimated over 10,000 Jews were killed in one year of the crusades. In the second crusade... All Jews in England were banned from England, France, Austria, many of them having to flee to Poland. In the 14th century, when the Black Death was spreading, the Jewish people were blamed for the plague. And over 900 Jews in one day were burned alive in Strasbourg. Fleeing Europe, many of them sought refuge in, in Russia and in the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire, the Jews... Were, were not persecuted as they were in Europe, but they were certainly marginalized and mistreated. 
The Jewish people were placed into a group called, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but it's Dimi, and they lived with many restrictions as a people. They paid a special tax. They had to require, they had to wear special clothing. They were banned from carrying guns, riding horses, building or repairing places of worship, or having any public procession of worship at all. Around the same time in 19th century, the largest Jewish population existed in Russia. Jews were given a section of land and refused to move inland or outside. They called it the Pale of Sediment, Settlement. Then as it progressed into the Soviet Union, the Jews were banned in all religious activities, had economic restrictions placed, and they were continually monitored by authorities. You follow history. You see nations turning against them, slaughtering them, controlling them. Then, of course, this leads to perhaps the height of anti-Semitism in 1933 to 1945, where you have Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, where Hitler, in ever-increasing hatred for the Jews, reached this all-time high. And by the way, young people, this history is important. He blamed the Jews for their loss in war. He blamed the Jews for communism and organized the Holocaust, meaning destruction or slaughter. The Holocaust was a systematic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of over 6 million Jews over a stretch of 44,000 imprisonment sites. 2 million Jews, these are all estimated numbers, were murdered at killing centers using poisonous gas. Two million Jews were killed in mass shooting operations. Another million Jews were placed and killed in concentration camps where they died through deliberate privation, disease, brutal treatment, and arbitrary acts of violence. At least 250,000 Jews were murdered in other acts of violence outside of camps and ghettos. All through history is a thread of hatred and violence, persecution, and an attempt to destroy and displace the people of Israel. And now we see, and I mean, I'm, I, don't, I didn't have time to go through all this, but now we see terrorist organizations, and this is what they are, such as Hamas. In the Hamas chapter, in their charter, this is, I got this directly from their charter, it says the Islamic resistance movement is a distinguished Palestinian movement whose allegiance is to Allah and whose way of life is Islam and strives to raise the banner of Allah over every inch of Palestine. On the, on the destruction of Israel, Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it just as it obliterated others before it. That's in the preamble. The day of judgment, listen to this, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees and the rocks and the trees will cry out, O Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. There is a thread of hatred, a desire to eliminate a people group. Off the face of the earth. What is this? Where can such hatred and determination to wipe out an entire race of people come from? There is a dragon hovering over a woman. Deceiving the nations to assist him. Here in the United States of America, there is an increasing rapid rise of anti-Semitism. New York, October 25th, since the Hamas massacre of of Israeli civilians on October 7th, so this is from the 7th to the 25th, there has been a record significant spike in anti-Semitic incidents across the United States. Preliminary data from the ADL Center on Extremism indicates that reported incidents of harassment, vandalism, and assault has increased by 388% over the same period last year. They have recorded a total of 312 anti-Semitic incidents between October 7th and October 23rd, 190 which were directly linked to the war in Israel and Gaza. By comparison, during the same period of 22, there were 64 incidents. Here are some of the incidents that have taken place in our country in the month of October. 
On October 8th in Clifton, New Jersey, a car with individuals holding Palestinian flags appeared to intentionally swerve out of its lane, nearly hitting a visible Jewish family. On October 10th in Los Angeles, California, an individual shouted, I am Hamas, and made death threats to Jewish individuals standing by a kosher restaurant. On October 12th in Indianapolis, Indiana, a, a man carrying an Israeli flag was, alleged, was assaulted by a pro-Palestinian protester. On October 15th in New York, uh, an individual allegedly punched a woman, a Jewish woman in the face at Grand Central Terminal. When she asked why, he responded, you are Jewish. On October 18th, and also in New York, a group of Israeli individuals were harassed and one was assaulted by a pro-Palestinian protester in Times Square. Also, there is nearly a thousand percent increase in the daily average of violent messages mentioning Jews and Israel in white supremacist, white, white, uh, right-wing extreme channels on the messaging forum and left-wing extremism as well. What in the world? What is this? Where people would want to run someone over for their race, punch an elderly woman for her race, celebrate the slaughter of hundreds of innocent people, regardless of the politics, regardless of what people think about this or that, the slaughter of innocent people. Here's what it is. It is a dragon hovering over a woman who has given birth to the man-child. But there is one more thing I want you to see. Verse 14, the Bible says this. Oh, wait, let me stop. i got to answer the question, and then I'll give you something good. The world hates Israel because the devil hates Israel. Why does the, the world hate Israel? Why, why have there been nations and kings who have made it their preoccupation to blame Israel for plagues, for, for economic loss, for the loss of war? One reason, because the devil hates Israel, because God loves Israel. So notice what happens. Verse 14. So the, so, so the, so the, so the dragon has his eyes on the woman. And to, to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle... That she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now this passage of scripture is referring to a period of time known as the tribulation where, where the devil is going to go heavily out of Israel in a way that we have never even seen before. And it describes as the devil is going to go after Israel that God is going to protect her. He gives her wings. He has the earth absorb the flood. And the picture is that while the dragon is trying to kill the woman, God protects the woman and keeps her safe. Listen. Because God has a plan for Israel, because God loves Israel, God has always given Israel wings. Because God loves Israel, he has always used the earth to swallow up the floods that have come her way. There, there is no earthly explanation for how a, for how a nation... That, is, that, that has a completely different form of worship, that is democratic in all its policies, sits in a region where every country around it wants its demise, except for this. God loves Israel, and throughout history, God has preserved and protected and will continue to preserve and to protect Israel. You can go back, not just 2,000 years, but to the very book of Exodus. And here's what you will find. God, no matter who, no matter what nation has attacked Israel, God has always been there to protect her and keep her alive. One of the greatest ways in recent memory where God used the earth to swallow up the flood was in 1947 when the United Nations, America, Britain worked together to allow Israel to have their own state, their own country. Listen to, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this resolution. November 29th, no, no, remember this. A people misplaced 
And everywhere they've been misplaced, abused, persecuted, demeaned, all the while praying and asking God to bring them back to the land that God had promised them. November 29, 1947, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted a resolution for the establishment of an independent Jewish state in Palestine and called upon the inhabitants of the country to, this, to take such steps as may be necessary on their part to put the plan into effect. The recognition by the United Nations of the right of the Jewish people to establish their independent state may not be revoked. It is, moreover, the self-evident right of the Jewish people to be a nation as all other nations in its own sovereign state. Accordingly, we, the members of the National Council representing the Jewish people in Palestine and the Zionist movement of the world, met together in solemn assembly today, the day of the termination of the British mandate for Palestine, by virtue of the natural and historic right of the Jewish and of the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called Israel. The state of Israel will be open to the immigration of Jews from all the countries of their dispersion. Will promote the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. Will be based on the precepts of liberty, justice, and peace taught by the Hebrew prophets. Will uphold the full social and political equality of all its citizens without distinction of race, creed, or sex will guarantee full freedom of conscience, worship, education, culture, will safeguard the sanctity and inviolability of the shrines and holy places of religions and will dedicate itself to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. The State of Israel will be ready to cooperate with the organization and representatives of the United Nations in the implementation of this resolution and will take steps to bring about the economic union over the whole of Palestine. We appeal to the United Nations to assist the Jewish people in the building of its state and to admit Israel into the family of nations. In the midst of wanton aggression, we yet call upon the Arab inhabitants of the state of Israel to return to the ways of peace and play their part in the development of the state with full and equal citizenship and due representation of its bodies and institutions, provisional or permanent. We offer peace and unity to all the neighboring states and their peoples, and we invite them to cooperate with the independent Jewish nation for the common good of all. Our call goes out for the Jewish people all over the world to rally our side in the task of immigration and, develop, and development and to stand by us in the great struggle for the fulfillment of the dream. The, this is in the, in the dream of generations, the redemption of Israel. We trust in Almighty God. We set our hand to this declaration at this session of the Provincial State of Council and the city of Tel Aviv on this Sabbath Eve, the 5th of IR, 5th, 50, I don't know, the 14th day of May 1948. This, this, this historical event that our young generation has no clue about, does not understand why it happened, the significance of it, why the nations moved to bring Israel back to the land that God had after generation of generation of abuse, misplacement, and persecution, and subjugation of all kinds of injustices. This was not just humankind being benevolent. This was God giving wings to Israel. This was God sucking up the flood and saying, I have a plan for these people. I love these people. And I will bring them back to the land that I have for them. The truth that I want to declare on the authority of the word of God is that the dragon is hovering to destroy Israel, but God is helping to redeem her. Yes, the dragon is hovering. And the media is jumping on it. And very innocent people, naive people, very well-meaning people with good hearts, I believe, are, are being deceived and unknowing truth and information are blindly following this. The dragon is hovering to destroy Israel, but God is helping to redeem her. And so let me give you a few points and we're done. From this, we have some truths. Here's the first one. 
This is not a political battle. It is a spiritual one. This is not about left wing, right wing, moderate. It's not what this is about. This is about a God who has chosen a people. And the dragon wants to devour the people. And there's enough human history to support the fact that there is some serious principalities going on to wipe away Israel. So I would say this, do not be deceived. Do not allow yourself to be consumed with this issue or that issue. Step back and see the overarching reality of what the people of Israel have endured and are enduring today. Understand this, as our country gets further away from the word of God and from the Lord, there will be more anti-Semitism. It is the word of God, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the understanding of the word of God, which has rooted in our nation a love and an appreciation for the people of Israel. And as that is wiped away, not only will people not see it, but people who do not like Christianity will therefore not like Israel as well. And so we need to know the truth and not be hateful and not be divisive and not be angry, but we need to, we need to share the truth of Jesus Christ, because the only answer to this is salvation. Amen. Secondly, I want to just say this, and I understand you can, but Jewish people are people. And they've suffered greatly. I, I'm going to tell you, I have so many more things I could have brought to the table, and it was hard to even type it. Just, 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 the, just the countless numbers of people of the generations of the Jews who have been slaughtered. They are, they are people. And we must never allow media to dehumanize a people who have faced such atrocities over human history. Thirdly, I want to say this to you and me as believers. The devil is hovering over us too. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, worketh, Seeking whom he may devour. You know what? The devil hates you and me because we're Christians. And he wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your testimony. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to destroy your hope. He wants to wreck you by getting you away from God and ruin your life. And you and I need to walk very soberly in our decisions and be very soberly about the things that we do in our life. Knowing this, that there is an enemy watching over us ready to destroy us. And the last thing I'm going to say is this. We look forward to the day that God will bring salvation to Israel. But I want to say this to us in this room. God wants to save you today. Amen. See, see, your salvation and my salvation isn't leaning into Revelation chapter 12. It's leaning into right here in the month of November. And God sent Jesus Christ, the man child who came... And he died and he paid for your sin and my sin so that we could be blessed. We are Gentiles and God wants to bless us through the man child, Jesus Christ. And by trusting in him and his sacrifice for our sin and trusting in him and calling upon him to be our savior. You and I can be saved from the wrath of God and be restored just as Adam and Eve were in the garden Walking with God, knowing God, but not just in the garden with us, living in us Amen. through the person of the Holy Ghost. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know the Lord, here's what I want you to understand. That the whole concept of the woman and the man child was for you to lead you to himself and bring salvation to your life. And so we ask the question, why does, why does, Israel, why does the world hate Israel? Because the dragon hates Israel. The dragon is hovering to destroy Israel. Oh, I got to give you one more point. Let me just give you, I, I, I'm, I can't. I got just one more, it'll be two seconds, two seconds. The protection of Israel is a proof of God's existence. You want, you want, you want some proof of the power of God? God went on record thousands of years ago that this people group would never be eliminated. And he's kept his word. And you look, at the, you look at the protection, and you look at the miracles, and you look at the stories of the people of Israel, there's only one explanation you can come down to. There's a God. And he went on record that I exist, and I will protect the people. That is an incredible proof of his existence. The dragon is hovering to destroy Israel. But God 
is helping to redeem her. With every head bowed, every eye closed before I pray. Maybe you're in here and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I've ever received the man-child. There's never been a time in my life where I've called upon Jesus Christ to save me. And you say, Pastor, if I were to die, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure I've received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me, Pastor? Would you slip your hand up so I could pray for you? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I've had my sins forgiven. I see your hand. God bless you. Is there someone else you say, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I've received the Lord. Would you just slip your hand up so I could pray for you? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you slip your hand up? Here in just a minute, I'm going to pray, and we're going to have a time of invitation. And maybe you want to come and, and pray for the people of Israel. Maybe you want to come and thank God for the man-child. Many different ways that the Holy Ghost has spoken. I want to encourage us to have a time of invitation. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much, God. We thank you so much for your goodness in our life. We pray for the people of Israel. We pray for their redemption. We pray for their protection. Pray, God, for the salvation of all people to receive Christ as their Savior. Bless this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed as we stand to our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The invitation is open this morning. Let's respond to God however he's spoken. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The invitation is open this morning.